Okay, so I have my printed out Celtic knot border that I'm going to use. I'll put a little bit of sticky tape on the top here. And there's a little bit of tape uh, just at the bottom there. Uh, just down here, so I've just held it in place. And what I'm going to do now is I've got some uh, paper, carbon paper here. You can use graphite paper or something similar. I'm just going to slide that through. And I'll probably just hold it in place. No need to tape it. Alright. I'll just pull it through a bit more. Might just wrap it around a bit and then hold it. Alright. And then what I'm going to do is I've got a uh, obviously a pen here. Uh, this one's actually uh, no inks coming out of it. It's sort of clogged, so I think it's actually had it. So, but it doesn't really matter with carbon paper because all we want to do is have something we have a bit of pressure to push on. And a ballpoint pen is quite good for this, so it doesn't matter if the ink comes out or not. Um, the advantage to having the ink coming out though is you can actually see what you've actually gone over. Now you probably find a cutting knot border or whatever you want to put on your table. Just going on Google Images or something like that. Uh, this one here I've got is actually from a Celtic knot a book on how to draw Celtic knots. And I didn't actually draw this one. I just took it from the book and I scanned it in. And then I uh, scaled it up uh, to size. So this table, this leg is about just over 40 millimeters wide. So I made this about 40 millimeters. And this table here is actually a um, just plain IKEA table. And it is solid wood, so that's good. Uh, you can actually carve things like MDF, because I have carved it before. It's quite good because it has no grain. Whereas uh, wood has uh, grain, and if you ever carved anything, you'll understand about working with the grain of the wood. Uh, depends on the wood, and it um, depends on also how sharp your tools are. And when I did my other video on my Celtic knot walking stick, um, I did try to give my tools a little bit of sharpen during making that video, but to be honest, they were pretty bad for, for my standards, and I've sharpened them quite a bit since then. And you should be able to see, oops, should be able to see during this uh, video, um, you know, that they sort of respond a bit, a bit better with carving out the wood. And I'm hoping now I've sort of got that, uh, now the, ta the, the tape came off, that um, I'm still sort of lined up roughly with what I've, uh, how, how I set it up. Otherwise we're going to have some lines that quite line up. But that's not a big deal because it won't be up on much. And I have to move this camera down. Let's see what I'm actually doing down here. Um, yeah, it sort of helps with that handmade look. So I don't know what it is about the Celtic knot. That I really like personally, but I don't know it's something about the pattern. So I've just always liked them. Like, it's um, very eye-catching, and uh, some people do some pretty amazing ones. And if you've never looked up much on Celtic knot work, there's a um, a book called the Book of Kells, K E L L S, and it's all this amazing um, Celtic knot work that was done in this old book. To be honest, I can't actually remember what the book was about. It could have been a religious one, I don't recall. And it may have been Irish, I just don't remember. But I remember seeing some of the things in that, and it's pretty amazing. Alright, so I'm just going to pull this tape out now. I might just, whoops, move that back a bit. Probably should have done like that. Alright, so I'll see how we went. And we can see, yep, there's some, yeah, with the lines there, and I've, I've missed a spot there. Um, so if you do miss a spot, it's always good to leave a bit of tape on there. Um, so you can just put it back up. Or in this case here, if I wanted to, I've got a, I've got a pencil here as well. Um, so 
So this piece obviously is missing, so what's going on there? So it's, uh, so I could just sort of sketch that, sketch that in if I wanted to. As I said, it's sort of handmade, so uh, this is not so bad, you know, doing it like this. Let's darken that up a bit. And with this table, uh, at this stage I was just going to do the legs and I probably will do something with the tabletop, but I haven't really worked out what as yet. Um, might try something lay or something, I don't know. And I'm going to use just hand tools on this particular project. Um, down here I'm going to actually get this tape because it's I seem to have missed quite a, quite a lot there. Um, so I'll move that back up there. All right. Mustn't have pressed hard enough, I think. That's yeah, there. You can see a bit stronger there, but you're missing something here. Oh, yeah. Today's the, uh, the last day of uh, summer, so I'm kind of looking forward to that, in a way. I mean, I do like it, but funnily enough, the heat lately has been getting to me. It doesn't normally get to me that much. I went to look at a, uh, a house, actually, in, um, in the country, in Victoria, here in Australia, an area called Wedderburn. It's a sort of, uh, oh, it's not really, it's not that remote, it's a, it's a I think it's sort of a, Maybe a bit of farming, but they do a bit of um, a bit with sheep, with wool and stuff there too. But that is house that was only um, sixty nine thousand on an acre of land. I thought it'd be good. I went and had a look, but it was a real pull down job. It was absolutely riddled with um, termites. Um, had bees everywhere, and there was honeycomb all around the place. Uh, one of the windows was missing, and. Um, there was some birds that got in, there was, there was crap everywhere. But out there, the heat, oh, far out. I mean, I've been in some parts of Australia, but the heat out there was just unbelievable. Because it's not near the water. So, yeah, so it just gets really, really hot. So anyway, I've got my um, my blade here, so sort I've of, sort of sharpened. And uh, I'd actually broken the tip off of this um, some time ago, and I, I just slowly um, sanded it back around. Uh, to, to get a point again because you do really want a point when you're doing um, sort of carving uh, it's around that it's you can't really get a good um, I don't know, sort of get the good control of the knife so I'm just going to put a little bit of light pressure just enough to score the wood and this is a um, some sort of soft timber like it's I don't think it's I'm not sure it's pine um, it's kind of, because it's an IKEA table it might be I don't know some sort of spruce or something, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, it's pretty pretty soft. Cutting through there. And I'm not sure whether the camera's gonna pick up these these lines. I might have to zoom in. But um, basically what I'm doing is I'm I'm tracing over um, the lines with the knife. And what I'm basically the reason I'm doing this is what I'm creating what's called a stop cut. And the reason it's called a stop cut is that as I uh, get the chisel later and move it towards these lines to, to remove some of the, the wood, it'll mean the chisel stops at that, that line. Because if I just got if I just got a chisel and just started just moving, it would just there'd be nowhere to stop it, just keep going right through. So um, that's the idea of the stop cut. And also take always be careful with sharp tools and know where your hands are and uh, try and be in control of your tool. Well, not try, you should be in control of your tools at all times. It takes a little bit of practice and I, I can certainly say that I was self-taught, I didn't even read any books when I first started carving. I just went at it with a chisel. Didn't even know there's different types of chisels. Um, and I cut my hands many times, many, many times. And uh, you get some pretty nasty ones. But you kind of learn from that. 
But even after doing it for a while, sometimes I've I've nicked myself. Not as bad as I used to do, but um, yeah. But you can still do it. Doesn't matter how many years experience. Uh, some people who do whittling, you know, the type of wood carving, um, they use a uh, a metal mesh glove. That also, I believe, um, butchers use them for, for boning, like because um, they're working with very sharp knives as well. So it's like a chain mesh glove, so it stops the, the knife going through and you know severing your finger or I mean at best cutting yourself, but at worst cutting something actually off your hand, like a finger or a thumb. All right. So keep going down here. I find it's a very therapeutic, personally, woodworking. And as I say to people, the um, the pleasure in making anything, I think, is not so much in the final product. That is nice to look at something you finished, but it's just now, this moment now. It's whoops. It's uh, it's in the uh, it's in the doing. It's always in the doing. It's where the pleasure is. You know, I'm actually enjoying the. Just controlling the knife. Just, I don't know, working with wood for me personally is yeah, really enjoyable. I know some people really like to work, work with metal. I've not really had much experience with that myself. Um, I'd like to try it one day. Even just welding or something like that would be a good, good skill to, to have. So in some ways it's a bit easier to cut across the grain. Uh, you can probably see the grain here, the way the, the vertical of the timber is going down. That's the grain, the direction. And cutting across it, is a, you have a bit more control in a way because it's a bit more resistance. Whereas if I go with it and I try and turn it, it's, it's a lot more easy to just go down with it. So um, it's easier to go down with it but harder to control. Whereas across the grain it's hard to go across it but it's... Um, Easier to control. That's what I find anyway. But that also depends on the timber or the wood. Like the harder it is, the harder it is the, the score and things. But as I said, this is a very soft wood, so it's not a lot of pressure is required. And you could use um, a rotary tool for this to do the lines, like a, a Dremel rotary tool, and I do have one of those. And I've, um, it's a very handy little tool to have actually for all sorts of projects. It's a good tool because it, I mean, you don't just have to use it for hobby things, it's good for fixing things, cleaning things. So I, um, I had an indicator on my four wheel drive that years ago that uh, was a rust, all oh, surface rust inside. It was really hard to try and get in it with the sandpaper or anything like that to try and get the rust off. And I tried, you know, some chemical things to try and get rid of the rust, but it just kept coming back. So I wanted to take it back to metal. And as I said, trying to get my finger in that little hole for the indicator light was really near impossible. But I've got like a, a little, some sort of, I can't really use a polishing thing, or like a, not a polishing thing, like a sanding thing uh, that I put on the Dremel, or it could have been even a bit. And I just, went around the inside of it, got such a small bit, and went around the surface of the inside and got off all the rust and then cleaned it up so the rust didn't come back. And it has, has been a couple of years now, so it's been quite good. But it's uh, pretty annoying when that happens. Because um, your indicator just starts making that funny noise too. You know, like, you know there's something wrong with it, but it was, I thought it was the globe at first, it had blown, but it was actually, uh, yeah, it's just a little rust and it wasn't getting any contact with the globe and the, the metal housing where it sits in. I've actually got to do some work on my four-wheel drive, maybe, oh, maybe not tomorrow because I want to visit, but probably on Friday. There's something wrong with the, the discs and uh, I'm not sure what, but I'm going to have to take that apart and have a look. All right, I'll see if I can zoom in a little bit, come in a bit. I don't know if it's going to be easy to see that or not. Uh, Look, it's not very good focus. I might be able to see that a little bit. Um, you can see there's a, 
I'll just use my fingernail. So it sort of grabs into there. You can sort of hear it. All right. So those are the stop cuts. And I do have around the corner here. I've already started this one. I started this one a little bit earlier. And you can sort of see the effect. Whoops. The effect that it's going to have. And it looks looking pretty good there so far. And I'll probably, I'm not sure what I'm going to do at this stage because um, as you can see, it's a different color. So this is the, obviously the table was stained probably just with a rag or something like that because it's not a very deep penetration of the stain. And then um, when I've chiseled away, uh, it's left the original timber color behind it, which has given this nice contrast. And I haven't even taken that much wood off actually, it's hardly anything. It's probably like uh, maybe a millimeter. All right, so I'll stop that there. And next thing I'll do, I'll just come back to uh, this other leak. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a go at uh, chiseling it. All right. Now, when you're carving, they will use gouges. Um, here, I've just got a normal, basic sort of um, chisel here, just a normal uh, bevel on it, and you can see it's fairly sharp. You can see it's sort of almost a mirror finish, and it's yeah, it is very sharp. So what I'm going to do is very, just gentle pressure, especially when your tools are sharp and you're using a soft wood. It's going to put a little bit in there, and I'm going to move towards the the stop cut. You can hear it stop. You hear that? It's stopping. So just slightly angle towards the cut. And if you have a little bit of um, a bit left over, it could mean that you need to make that cut again. Or was just do what I did there, just use the chisel just to remove that little bit. I'm going to cross the grain here, just gently, just follow the, the line of that stop cut. And it's always, so it's always about having control of the tool. Um, I could go at this really hard, but then I'll lose control and I could probably break bits off that I don't want to break off. And I can Yeah, that bit it sort of didn't like that sound, so I'm going to come at it a bit differently, a bit of an angle. I'm going to trace up slightly, just across that line again. This one here, slightly angle the chisel up against that line. Starting to remove some of that um, wood from behind now, and you can start to see the contrast, which will start to form the shape. a little bit in there. I'm just going to use the chisel and stab that a little bit. Okay. Whatever this wood is actually, it's really nice to carve. But, well, at least doing this, it's um, pretty easy to carve. Now, the type of carving I'm actually doing is called relief carving. And it's... The difference is between, say, uh, what they call it actually when you do it like a, a sculptural sort of carving. Um, oh, I've kind of lost me, I can't think of what it is. Um, anyway, the relief carving is, a, is a, pretty much what we've done. It's a, you draw, draw a design, put some, put some lines, stop cuts, and then you just take remove a little bit of wood. You can go pretty deep if you wanted to as well, you, as deep as you want to, but it's, it's pretty much working on a two dimensional surface uh, or a plane like this, whereas you know, sometimes people do sculptures in wood or stone or anything like that, you know. Um, and, oh jeez, I can't remember what that's called. I've never actually done it, actually. I'd like to try that type of carving to, to carve something and, um, in 3D. Or, um, yeah, like the actual model. So I took a little bit too much up there. I should have done a little bit of cut, so I'll just... Yeah, this one's a bit, that's a bit there. Probably should get the knife and just make a bit more of a better cut because that's making a bit of a mess of that there. And that's what you can always do. If it's starting to do what I'm doing here, it's having a little bit of trouble trying to get those pieces out. Or there's a bit of, you know, like a furry bit, <laughs> I call it, left behind. Um, you can just go over again with the, with the knife. And uh, looking at this, I'm not even sure if I got this bit here. Uh, it doesn't look like it.
like anything uh, is practice. But yeah, it's gen just gently, I mean, if you, as I say, if your tools are sharp, you don't have to go pretty very hard at things, it just sort of glides nicely. So I make a bit more of a deeper stop cut here with the chisel. You start to see it coming out now. Okay. And there's a lot of things you can do with um, the way I'm sort of doing this now. I mean, if you had raw wood, you mean, if this wasn't stained, you could have, you could stain all of this uh, you know, black or paint it black. And then if you carved out this, you'd have a real contrast. You'd have this all black and this all light color or you know, vice versa. You could try and make this all black at the background and leave this and then if you get a bit of paint or whatever on there, you can just try and sand it. So uh, you get different effects to really bring out the design. And I'm not really sure what I'm going to do at this stage. Oops, I've taken a little bit too much timber off there. So, uh, yeah, you can sort of see what I've done now. I'm going to see what I'm going to it there. But, um, yeah, where the, where the, the knots, because obviously the knot, I'll get a little bit of paper. Obviously the knots do this uh, over and under. So this, this cord goes under this one and then up again. And when you do Celtic knotwork, you can actually you know, sort of carve like down and up and over and that as well. And I'm not sure I'll do that or not. Um, only because at the moment I'm kind of thinking about how I'm going to finish this uh, in terms of stains and colours because I quite like this contrast with the, the lighter wood. And if I was to carve downwards on these where it joins, well, you're going to see this white bit, and I'm not sure that's going to look very good. But I don't know, I mean, sometimes I get bogged down too much thinking about all these details and sometimes it works out when I do that, well it usually does, but the frustrating thing about thinking things through too much sometimes is you don't end up doing anything <laughs> except thinking. And often I just want to carve, so I just think, oh, I'll just pick anything and just have a go and just enjoy the process of doing it. in um, hand carving, making things by hand, and uh, a lot of people don't really understand that. If they're never, well, often because they've never made things themselves, and they don't have appreciation for anything, and and that's uh, unfortunately because we've got such a mass-produced sort of society nowadays, uh, and people can buy things so cheaply at department, you know, cheap department stores like uh, here we've got Kmart, Target. Uh, America, you probably got, I think Walmart, one of the big ones, um, and things are pretty cheap, but they're best produced on machines, and some people, well, there's nothing wrong with that, if you're just, you know, happy with that, but there is a certain sort of uh, charm that you get with a handmade thing, and I mean, I haven't actually made anything this time, I'm just actually designing, I put some, or didn't even design, I was putting a design on this, but uh, when people actually make things from scratch, like a like a table or something by hand and they you know they're a good artisan or something well you know, it's a good quality item it's going to last a long time not like a not like a cheap particle board thing which is just crap but uh, you know not everybody can afford it either so I can understand that because handmade things do cost a lot more money usually all the time and I do sell things from time to time but what I found was um, by selling things and I, I had a bit of a business going many years ago selling things I used to make and I was making the same sort of thing over and over again my designs same thing over and over again but uh, it became 
It became a bit of a chore actually. I, was, I sort of lost the enjoyment of it because it just became, really became a little, a little business. And um, I mean, it's nice to make a little bit of extra money. I mean, you need money to, to get by to some degree. Um, oops, not too far there. That stop cut's not quite deep enough. I was going to grab the knife there, but you may have noticed I was talking during the time I was doing that, where I grab the chisel here, and I can use the knife, but I put it in the stop cut, and I've just put a little bit of pressure and just wiggled. That's another way you can do it, and if you don't want to swap tools. So I'm just making a little bit deeper incision. So yeah, as I was saying before, I've got to get onto my car. Um, oh, I've got to move this thing down as well. Because <coughs> it's, um, yeah, something going on with the, uh, the front discs. So it could be, could, be, could be a few things, and I'm hoping it's just something simple. <laughs> um, like little caliper things, whatever they are. But, uh, press against the discs, hopefully that's just jammed and I can sort of free it up. And hopefully it's not. I mean, I can tell the discs actually need to be remachined if there's enough metal on them. Um, or I'll have to buy new ones. Which is not going to be great spending that money. And it could be the brake pads, so I don't know. I'm not much of a car person, I don't really know a lot about cars, but uh, I know the exhaust is something wrong with that too. <laughs> There's a hole in that. And I'm thinking about, I don't know, I'll probably take that to a shop, say, hey, look, you do it, I can't be bothered getting under the car. <clears throat> Although at least, as I said, it's a I've got a four-wheel drive, so it's a lot easier to get under a four-wheel drive than a normal car. You don't even need to jack it up a lot of the time. Um, I was actually going to do a video a long time ago when I uh, actually painted my car. Um, <laughs> not professionally, that's for sure. Uh, and I did actually Celtic, Celtic not work on it. And it was something I designed myself. I just took a photo of my, uh, my car many years ago. Side on and then I got the dimensions of it, roughly. And I put it into a program um, called AutoCAD actually. Because uh, I'm, uh, my background's in drafting, and so that's a drafting program. So I put the image in that, and then I was able to scale it to size, and then I could uh, design my pattern on it. So then I printed it out. Um, but because it's such a big design, you know, obviously the printer, my printer's not going to <laughs> going to be able to cover half the half the side of a car. So I just print out on lots of little um, A4 sheets and then I stuck them all together and then I um, stuck it onto the, the car and I, the way I did it actually um, you, you probably wouldn't want to do it with a, <laughs> a newish car with, with good paint but you know mine's a pretty big dump hole four wheel drive and I'm not that worried about that sort of stuff anyway but uh, I used um, a glue stick to, oops, to glue the design to the car, uh, paintwork, and because it's a glue stick, it's usually water soluble. Once I put the pattern down onto the car, I um, yeah, let the yeah the, the glue made a seal basically, so no paint spray paint went under the under the pattern. And then once that was dry, I removed the. All the paper, which was basically a stencil, and to get rid of the, the glue, I just um, I got the hose and went down the car, and then just used a sponge and just kept rubbing it, and then it sort of yeah, it all came off, and it sort of worked pretty well. 
But I said, if you've got a Jewish car or something, you might not want to do that. I don't know if it ruins the paint, but mine's a pretty old car. It's been through the bush <laughs> a lot. So, you know, I, don't, I just I don't really care. And I just did that because I just, you know, just enjoy it. Just enjoy looking at it. And you certainly get some weird looks uh, with, <laughs> with my car. Especially out in the country. Um, yeah. I don't know why people get really threatened when things are different. Oh, I don't really care about that. I just noticed it. <laughs> So yeah, I was thinking about doing a video about that a long time ago, but I don't know, maybe, maybe I can still do a video on that. Although I have sort of finished the car now, but maybe I could find a little spot where I could just give an example of how I did it. As I said, it's not, a, it's not exactly a pro thing, <laughs> but you know, look, I don't, so I don't really care about that personally. But I do appreciate when people put in a lot of effort to things because, you know, there's, there's something to enjoy too, is the skill people develop to get things so perfect. And they really spend time and yeah, I can appreciate that. It's like, uh, I've done a lot of things in my life, like different sort of hobbies and courses and stuff and I studied fashion a long time ago. And so, yeah, a lot of sewing and things and I quite enjoyed sewing for a long time, well, especially when I was younger. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's quite good and pattern making too was interesting. To making the patterns for the clothes. Uh, because of my background in drafting, that, that would found me very handy for that. Um, and I went to an exhibition. Actually, I don't know if it was an exhibition, I think it might be a permanent, a permanent thing, at the National Gallery in Melbourne. And they've got, they had a little area of, yeah, just sort of different clothing and you know, different Versace dresses and all sorts of other things. And uh, funnily enough, I didn't think the Versace dress was made very well. <laughs> but my point was that uh, by doing something, having a go at, say, sewing before myself, I could really appreciate things that had been done. You know, when I looked at them, because I, you know, I just know how much work goes into it. And that's what I often say about a lot of things, that if you even tried something, even once yourself, it doesn't matter if you're crap at it or not. Um, if you at least tried it yourself and then you see so what someone else has done, you can really appreciate how much skill there was in, um, in being able to achieve whatever that person has done, whatever it might be, you know, whether it's woodwork, metalwork, you know, welding. I mean, I haven't welded, but I can certainly tell when I've seen welds and say that's a, that's a pretty impressive, impressive weld. You know, a lot of skill in, in doing that. And that's just appreciation for that, you know, what someone else has done. But fortunately, a lot of people don't seem to really care. <laughs> I just don't know, I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure what it is. I guess a lot of people just, uh, you know, turn on the television, watch that, don't really do anything. Which, you know, it's fine, I'm not saying anything against it, but uh, it's uh, a bit of a shame because there's a lot of things you can enjoy, a lot of hobbies and stuff. Uh, I've got a friend of mine who's really into music, really into techno and stuff, and um, He's never learned an instrument, but I know he's got good ideas for, you know, electronic sort of music. So on the weekend, we, I actually took him down a um, program that I had, a software package, and and uh, we made some music. And um, and since uh, he's had it, he's actually was playing around it last night, and it's yeah, it's good. It's good to see him doing that because um, I know it's, to me it seemed you know really constructive, you know, um, and good thing because. You know, he's got other hobbies too, but I don't know, I just thought that would be something that he'd probably really enjoy, and it seems that he is. So, yeah, I'm glad he's doing that. And he's just bought a, um, a new MIDI, which made me want to get one, another one myself, actually. My um, main instrument, though, I don't really play piano very well, but is uh, was guitar, that's what I sort of did. At, um, when I did that at high school in music, as a, what we had, what's called VCE, that was our our last years of high school. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, year 11 and 12, so we have VCE in Victoria. I think it's HSC in New South Wales. I don't know about the other states. And um, yeah, so I did that and it's pretty hard actually um, when you get to that sort of level. 
And it's funny because even at that level, I actually still can't really read music. <laughs> I sort of faked it. So you'd have a book there when you were going to play or do your recital or whatever. And you're supposed to like be playing from the book, but I just do listen to the music beforehand and you know it by ear and then just play it by ear. And then I'll be looking at the book as if I'm reading the book, but in fact, I was actually just playing by ear. Which is funny because some people thought, oh, gee, he's, he's pretty good because he just plays really naturally. But like, well, I kind of am playing naturally. I'm sort of cheating because <laughs> I don't know how to read the music. But yeah, I don't really play the guitar that much anymore. But, uh, all right. So, here we have a look. That's the, that's the legs there. As you can see, I've still got to do at the top here, a bit there. As you can see on this side here, I just drew a, a very rough line there. And I'll probably do that now. What I just did was, I'll try and line it up. Well, it'd be good if I did. Just hold that there. And just have to drag that very gently to score a line. So, it's better to do a lot of small gentle lines than trying to do one big one, because sometimes you go right off and you lose. Yeah, look, that looks okay. So yeah, I've got a friend uh, popping over tomorrow afternoon, a man that I met uh, last year actually. Um, we met at, uh, at Philosophy, uh, Philosophy Day, um, just here where I live, a place called Ballarat. And uh, yeah, he's right into that and we, we get along real well. Talk about philosophy and all sorts of stuff. And uh, he's, uh, he's an artist. And uh, actually through him I've met a lot of other artists and um, some well-known ones and and um, really nice people. I've met, met some really great people and uh, his, um, his house is pretty amazing too, his gardens. He uh, basically re reproduced one of Monet's paintings. Um, he's built like a lake with a, that stone, all sort of stone bridge thing over it. It was a bit like that anyway, I'm not sure it's exactly like the painting. But, um, but it looks fantastic. Yeah, I'd like to have my own place one day. But, you know, but things are so expensive. And I don't really want to work my, you know, my butt off just to, to buy a house. Um, but it'd be great, because then I'll probably turn, on the, turn it into like a work of art, my, my house. <laughs> I'll probably do a lot of Celtic knot work, actually. So yeah, I'm just following the line there. It's sort of wiggling. See, I can just wiggling the chisel a little bit when it gets a little bit stuck. Try and get it going, but not putting too much pressure. Just, just want to gently do that. All right. Yeah, so there's four chairs that came with this table too from Ikea. I think it was about $149 or something. It was long, many years ago, I can't remember exactly. I think it was around that. So, solid wood table with four solid uh, chairs, solid wood chairs. And I thought I'd just do something different with them. And, but yeah, so it's pretty good. But I'm going to leave that there for tonight. And I might even upload this video tonight as, as like, say, part one and sort of see how we go. But um, yeah, so that's the beginning of it. So. Hopefully you've got an idea at least with that if you want to start your own project and uh, as I go on I'll, I'll look at the other bits and pieces. Um, but the, the method I'll be using will be the same, just the, the stop cuts, well obviously the, the pattern, the tracing, then the stop cuts and then the, the chisel. And then um, as I said I'll, I'll look at the tabletop and that um, maybe later. I'm pretty sure I'll do something with the tabletop. But uh, hopefully you found that uh, enjoyable. If you've got any questions uh, leave them in the comments below and I'll, um, I'll uh, answer them the best I can. <laughs>